thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. My gosh, what an elite and esteemed group of individuals that I get to share this stage and this podium. I am very humbled. So uh, it's traditional at these kind of events for somebody to come up here and give a slew of thank yous to all the people that you know helped you get to this position. But as a cartoonist, I thought I'd try something a little different. So Dan, I'm gonna ask you to put up my presentation, if you don't mind, on the stream. I thought it would be appropriate to thank the politicians whose faces have inspired me over the years and helped me get here. So first I thought we'd start with the, one of the first uh, politicians I remember drawing. This is um, <laughs> Abraham Lincoln, uh, Gettysburg Address. And, and this cartoon, by the way, is, a, is a, a very important cartoon because this cartoon inspired a feature-length motion picture starring Daniel Day-Lewis, <laughs> this cartoon. But American presidents have long supplied cartoonists with facial fodder. You know, we have Republicans like Ronald Reagan, you know, here with his sidekick, Mikhail Gorbachev, um, and also George W. Bush. And not to be outdone, of course, we also have Democrats, um, both old <laughs> and new. And of course, the, it's not just presidents that help us out, these cartoonists, vice presidents too. Um, we have someone like Joe Biden. <laughs> and then, oh, of course, uh, this one, I, I love this one, uh, Dick Cheney. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we also had, I have to be special thanks to the supporting staff from the 2016 election who kind of prepped us, got us all ready, the cartoonists and satirists, for the year of Donald Trump. So Donald Trump has been really like a walking, talking cartoon, uh, and it's been a target-rich environment pretty much in this year, but there's been four big events that have stood out as special sources for satiric inspiration. So the first one um, is Twitter. So we have this woman, you guys probably know about her, she's got the toughest job in Washington, okay? She's got to do damage control, and she has to catch wayward tweets and the, before they can possibly cause any damage. And we know, of course, how, how difficult and how fiery these tweets can be, and she can work really hard, and with some luck, she may end up nailing it, and she can go, whew, triumph, except this is what the reality is. So the second um, big item of the year was um, Donald Trump's treatment of enemies, uh, both foreign and domestic. So we have a cartoon here. You can see the Trump supporter, and he's saying, finally, a sane and sensible president willing to take on Kim Jong-un and Uncle Sam is saying, that's Mitch McConnell. <laughs> and then speaking of North Korea, we have these two guys, and this cartoon's got a very simple caption that says, nuclear buttons we'd all prefer. <laughs> so anyways, the, really the, the, the big story of the year, though, is this. This is Russia. Russia and Putin, big story of the year. Now, you guys remember this first meeting between these two. We actually now have a transcript of this conversation. And it goes like this. So, so, so there's Putin. He's saying, hello, Donald. I tapped your last election, attacking your most defining national institution. And I intend to do it again, only this time with more precision. And Donald Trump said, you had me at hello. <laughs> so, so I know we have a lot of journalists in the room, but you guys might have missed this story. There was a press conference just late this afternoon with, uh, uh, with Vladimir Putin, and he was asked this question, President Putin, how do you respond to the recent turmoil in the White House? And his, he, well, he, he thought for a second, and then he thought some more. Oh, God, he was really chewing it around in his head. And the more he thought about it, the more he began to think, well, you know, um, but he, he pulled himself together. He got himself up straight, and he gave his response. 
No comment. So anyways, um, you know, yeah, so the cartoons and the politicians have been great, but I actually have, on a more serious side, I do have three uh, big thank yous to uh, give out. So the first is for my family. My wife, Sue, my son, Dan, my daughter, Amy, who are here. Uh, great support, great love. It's so much fun to have you around, and uh, I really love you guys. Thanks ever so much. Then, the Baltimore Sun. Yes, applause my family. Give it up for my family. Good. Thank you. So, then there's the Baltimore Sun now, specifically my editorial page editor, Andy Green, and editor and publisher, Triff uh, Alatsis, who are here too, because of their support to me, but also their support of cartooning. Now, the Baltimore Sun understands the value that a cartoon can bring to a media organization. And if any of your organizations out there don't have a cartoonist, I think you should reconsider. Now, primarily because cartoons are superstars of social media, a place where we all want to be. But also because cartoons have that special brand of humor and satire that are badly needed in these troubling and tumultuous times. Now, finally, I have a deep sense of gratitude that I work in a country where cartoons and satire are embraced and celebrated. Now this year marks the 30th anniversary of the landmark Supreme Court decision of Jerry Falwell versus Hustler magazine, which came back in favor of satire. And in the writing uh, and opinion, Chief Justice Rehnquist talked about how cartoons and satire are essential parts of a mature democracy. So, as we have politicians who insist on acting immature in this immature democracy, I'd like to say today that I believe that cartooning and satire have got a very bright future here in America. So I want to thank the National Press Foundation, and I want to thank you guys for your time. Great stuff. Thank you. Thank you.